Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Divers Ready. My name's James and welcome to this, your subscriber channel update for February 2021. We've got three big pieces of news. Well, we've got three pieces of news to share. I won't say they're all big. I would say the first is uh, small news and that's an update on how my ear procedure went. And I want to say a great big thank you to literally the dozens of you who sent emails or texts or messages or commented on that video uh, wishing me well for the procedure. I owe you guys an update. Uh, so we're gonna take care of that and thank you so much again. The second piece of news we've got, which is the medium sized news, is an opportunity that I have for you guys, my subscribers, the Divers Ready community, to get your hands on some fantastic scuba diving gear whilst also supporting your favorite scuba diving YouTube channel. So stay tuned for that. And lastly, the really big news, the huge news, well, you're just gonna have to wait for the really big news. That's all there is to say about that. So let's dive in with the news. As always, at the end of the video, I'm gonna do a Q&A. So I'll answer questions that I've pulled from the comments that you guys have put out there, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, using the hashtag AskDiversReady. Okay, I've got a cup of tea, as always, treasure divers. So let's dive into it. First up then, update on how my ear procedure went. We went with option A first, the more conservative approach, the, uh, the paper patch. The paper patch is in, it's in place. Not without a few small hiccups, let me tell you the story. Um, last Thursday, that you're watching this, no, two Thursdays ago, I went in to see my ENT doctor, my otorologist, however the hell you pronounce that, and we had the procedure scheduled and I was supposed to just be sitting in kind of like a dentist chair, slightly reclined, and he was going to go in with a needle, make a second hole in my eardrum, drain out a whole bunch of nasty fluid that the CT scan had actually uh, shown was behind my eardrum, all kinds of nastiness, pays not to think about it. Uh, draw all that nasty gunk out and then patch up both the hole that was existing or the separation of my eardrum and the hole he just made. Now, the paper that they use for this is very similar to cigarette paper. It's very thin, light paper. And they were out, they ran out. They literally didn't have any paper patch kits in the clinic. So the doctor literally sent me down to the street, out of the hospital, to the 7-Eleven to buy rolling papers, to buy cigarette papers. Hi there, I need some rolling papers, please. Uh, cigarette paper. There we go. Thank you. All right, so. Um, I've never bought cigarette papers in my life. I don't smoke anything. And so there I am in 7 Eleven buying cigarette papers for the first time to be put into my ear. Funny side story, that. Anyway, long story short, he gets into my ear and he's having a look in there and he realizes that the outer ear canal has swollen up. It's worse than it was when he'd first seen me three weeks prior. And he couldn't get the angle, because I've got big shoulders, to get the needle where he wanted to drain all the nastiness out. So I, I wanna, you're taking four weeks off. I wanna make sure this works. Yeah. I, I can make sure this works a lot more if, if you were kind of numbed, you know, anesthetized and I could really set this exactly where I want to set it. Okay. And get maybe even a little more of the fluid out. I show up the next day to a different clinic hospital that he also works at and uh, got knocked out. The anesthesiologist said it took uh, enough gas to kill a horse in order to render me unconscious, which doesn't surprise me or any of my regular viewers in the slightest. Unconscious, he was able to manipulate my head, move me around and all that kind of stuff, get the needle in, uh, draw what he, the ENT described as 20 years of infection debris out from behind my uh, eardrum, get the paper patches in place, and that's it, there is no update. He was happy with his work, he was happy with how the procedure went, but we won't know if it's successful until the end of the healing period, which is four weeks. So I've got four weeks dry, no teaching, no diving, no airplanes. I'm not even allowed to like forcefully sneeze. I have to sneeze through my mouth. I can't equalize right now because I don't want to disturb the eardrum and the patches in place. So there's no more update. I don't know if it was successful yet. We've just got to give it time and let it heal. So that's basically what I'm doing. I'm doing a bunch of stuff around the house. 
I'm catching up on my, uh, my reading and making videos, content, writing videos, and reaching out to our content partners and all that kind of good stuff, but no diving right now. That's it. Is what it is. Hopefully everything heals well and normal service will be resumed. So that's pretty much your update. Again, great big thank you to everyone, everyone who sent messages wishing me well for the procedure and only time will tell. Second piece of news, the, the, the medium-sized news, shall we say. Uh, two events have collided in recent weeks. Number one, I've racked up some pretty sizable medical bills. And number two, the dive locker hit capacity. Yep, that took nine months. We filled this space and I'm not a hoarder and I'm not good with clutter. So let's put those two ideas together and liquidate some dive gear. Now I got a whole bunch of stuff that I just don't use anymore and it's in still good working condition. I'm not gonna sell anything that belongs in a dumpster. But I was, I was going through and I was about to put everything up on eBay, as you normally would, or Facebook Marketplace or one of those sales apps. And then I thought, well, hang on a minute. Why not offer it to the Divers Ready community first dibs? So basically, that's what we're going to do. We're going to kind of have a silent auction and it's going to run from today, right now, you're watching this video, for two weeks. Now, if you haven't done a silent auction before, basically, I have a link in the description of this video to a uh, Excel and a PDF document. It's the same document. Has a picture there, has the title, has a link to the manufacturer's page. You can read all the specs. It has a condition report. It has a cute little column called James Says, which kind of tells you my history with the product. It tells you what the RRP for the product is, the, the retail price. And I've put a starting bid there, which is kind of like the lowest amount that I'd let something go for. And then if you see something you like, you can put a bid in send it to me at drspringcleaning at gmail.com. I made a special email address just for that. Yes, I did do that. And, uh, and we're gonna have a silent auction. Then I will contact you via email if you happen to have the winning bid in two weeks time. There are rules and conditions at the bottom of the page just to make sure it's fair to everyone. So please make sure you scroll all the way to the bottom and read those conditions. But I figured like, it's a lot of good gear some of it's brand new. I've got a brand new regulator. There's brand new lights in there, never wet, never out of the box, brand new fins. Other stuff is lightly used. Everything's in good working condition. So I was like, well, why not offer it to you guys first? And then anything that doesn't sell in the auction, then I'll put it up on eBay. So there you go. That's the medium sized news. Now time for the really big news. Come here. Are you sleepy? Come here. Oh, I'd like you to meet the newest member of the Divers Ready family. We've kept him on low radar because we just got him spayed, uh, neutered. Uh, bit of a sad story. Basically, uh, my wife, Karina, saw a Facebook ad uh, that that little guy had been dropped on I-95, the main highway north-south through the state of Florida. Uh, a 10-lane highway, people speeding 85 miles an hour. Some piece of human garbage decided that was a good place to drop off a dog that they no longer wanted. But luckily he was found by a young couple and uh, and they made a Facebook ad and my wife saw it and we were like, yep, done. He's a crazy little guy. He's an absolute wrecking ball. Yes, we named him after the drummer from Led Zeppelin, of course. Um, and, you know, I was bringing him back from the vets when we got neutered. We had the immigration song on and we were rocking out pretty good to that. But he's just a sweetheart. All he wants is love and attention and a, a safe home. And uh, yeah, so we've added him to our tribe. Um, as for breed, pff, your guess is as good as mine. Um, the vet said he's got some mountain dog in him. He does have that kind of St. Bernard coloring, 
but he's about one years old, they think, by his, uh, his dental condition. And he's just a fantastic little puppy. So yeah, please join us in the comment section and welcome uh, Bonham to our clan. It's truly an amazing thing. That's my big news. Mmm, that's a good cup of tea. Right, before we move into the Q&A, I also want to give a quick shout out to Jason Walker uh, from Belton, Texas, who sent me that epic diver's helmet. That is an absolutely blinding gift. Thank you so much, Jason. Really appreciate you thinking of us. And uh, yeah, that's gonna adorn the diver's locky video backdrop for many a video to come. Thank you ever so much, mate, appreciate it. Right, on to the q and I've got my questions here as always. Let's dive straight in. Uh, again, hashtag Ask Divers Ready on all the social media so I can find your questions. Oh, it's a celebrity edition. Brian Davies Scuba. How you doing, Brian? Uh, are there seahorses in Florida? Yes, yeah, there are. You gotta look for them hard. Uh, but we have, in Florida, one of the best shore dives you can do in the whole of the United States. That's the Blue Heron Bridge. Uh, it's a very, very easy beginner level dive, very shallow, very good conditions for macro photography. And I see people posting photos of seahorses from there all the time. I personally haven't seen any, but they're there, I know for a fact. Uh, next question comes from Critter Hunter. To stop the bubbles from hitting my camera while filming and making the clip shaky, I was looking for a double hose type regulator that bubbles release in the back, but the only company I found is shut down. Are there similar options? Uh, hey Critter Hunter, how you doing mate? Um, no, no there aren't. Uh, and the main reason for that is because it's 2021 mate. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's a good question. Okay, so shaky clips and bubbles hitting the camera presumes that the camera is higher than your regulator. So I would definitely recommend a handheld rig below the level of the bowls. Um, you can also change out the exhaust tees on most modern regulators and get a wider arc. So even if you do have a mask or head mounted camera, the bubbles are coming more out to the side. I know for example, in the Apex regulators, you can definitely change out the exhaust tees on those. Uh, but as for double hose regulators, no mate, it's it's 2021. That, that, you know, I know a guy who had one from the company that you're talking about and the thing literally fell apart in his hands. You, it was garbage, absolute garbage. Do not be tempted for that kind of style over substance. Absolutely not. Moving on. Uh, Matt Johnson says, Hey, I was thinking about starting scuba diving soon at age 13. Is there anything you recommend? Well, that's a big question, Matt, but first of all, I want to say, Congratulations and good luck to you, because I wish I started diving at 13. I waited till I was 16, but Christ, if I just started when I was 13, it would have been amazing. Um, so good luck to you on that one. Is there anything you recommend? Yeah, just find an instructor that you want to work with. So it's it's you know important that you talk to your instructor before you start class, and just like you're in school, I presume at age 13, you probably have favorite teachers, teachers that you like and teachers that you don't like as much. And the ones that you like, it's because they teach in a way that makes the subject interesting to you. Scuba diving is the same way, but there's a whole bunch of different instructors out there who teach in a whole bunch of different styles. So you wanna find someone that you can relate to just in the same way as your favorite teachers at school, Matt. But good luck to you, mate. All the best uh, and welcome to the scuba diving club. Absolutely. Thanks for your question. Colin Brown asks, uh, what are the small plastic cue cards you have hanging up next to the open water slate? Um, I'll go get them for you one moment. So they are exactly that, they're cue cards. They're little tiny credit card size cards and on each one there is a skill or a drill. Um, these ones are actually made by uh, TDI, Technical Diving International, and I bought them through their website. But for example, I can have these clipped off in my pocket, and if I want to do some surprise skills on a student, I whip these cards out and show them, for example, safety drill and bubble check. Or primary regulator is malfunctioning, and they're supposed to respond accordingly. So very useful training tool. I like those a lot. Uh, if you do a tech course with me, you're gonna see me whip one of those out for sure at least once, normally multiple times during a course. 
Thanks so much for your question, Colin. Uh, next up we have G. My question is, is there any plans in the future for modifying the current method of air sharing? I just don't see primary donate as being an option since this COVID mess and a lot of other standards have already been modified. It's a great question, G. Um, and I, I'm gonna paraphrase my answer by saying that I don't work for a training agency and I don't set the training standards. So I don't know if standards are gonna change until they do. I would say this, okay, primary donate is still the best method for air sharing from an in-water perspective. Not from a COVID perspective, obviously. I would also back that up by saying that drowning is forever. They can't fix drowning. So your priority, if you're gonna to continue to scuba dive and be underwater while there's a COVID pandemic going on, is to still practice for a long hose donate, okay? Now, if you want to, have a recreational setup with an octopus, a traditional yellow hose secondary that is donated, by all means, that's your right to do that. And if, if you have a regular diving buddy, you guys can set those standards on your own. But I don't see primary donate going away because of COVID, because like I said, they can fix COVID, they can't fix drowning. Anyway, hope that answers your question, G. Really appreciate it. Uh, shout out to Luke Phillips. Hashtag Ask Divers Ready. Hey James, I'm interested in becoming a scuba diver and I was wondering if you know of any good forums that aren't full of bickering and infighting that I could check out. I've been free diving and snorkeling a few times on vacation, but I have no experience with scuba diving. The diving in my area, South Central Alaska, woo, is supposed to be phenomenal, especially for my main interest, which is wildlife. Another question I have for you is, do you have any tips for cold water diving? Yes, okay. Lot going on there, lot to unpack. First off, do I know any good forums that aren't full of bickering and infighting? No, I don't. I'm sorry. Sorry, Luke, that's a negative answer on that one. I don't know of any forums. It seems to me that forums, rightly so, are going the way of the dinosaur because people are fed up of the negativity. I used to be a paid sponsor of Scuba Board before we had the channel, before anything else. I used to actually support and sponsor Scuba Board and I pulled the money away from it because I just didn't want to go on that space anymore because it's just a bunch of people arguing. And most of those people are armchair divers that never actually get in the bloody water. So that's my answer there, Luke, I'm sorry. Uh, one of the nice things that I love about the Divers Ready community is anybody putting negative uh, vibes out there or nasty comments, I'm on it like a flash and they get kicked out and they get blocked from all my content. Done, you're gone. Like the forums don't seem to take that approach. I'm very vigilant about that because I wanna keep this community positive and supportive for everyone. And I love seeing the interaction where someone posts a comment to me and maybe it takes me a while to see it and somebody else comes in and answers their question for them. And that's fantastic and I wanna stay like that. So we're very protective here. I don't call this a forum, but we're very protective of the community here other places not so much that's basically been my experience as for any tips for cold water diving you're going to learn if you do your open water up in alaska you're going to learn as part of your open water course how to dive a dry suit how to properly prepare and and get you know the right level of insulation for the water temperatures that you're diving i'm super jealous alaska as you know particularly the halibut is on my bucket list so let me know when you get certified mate i'll come up and dive with you um but my tips for cold water diving, this is, this is a really big one that I always give when I do an ice dive, a specialty course, is preparedness before and after the dive. Cold water diving when you're in the water is easy because you're just diving, it's just a bit colder. It's really about, okay, how am I gonna get changed? Where are my dry clothes? Where's my towel? Where, am, where are my hand warmers? The things you need before and after the dive. Where am I gonna stage my gear before and after a cold water dive so it's efficient and I'm not, left soaking wet and freezing cold and I don't know where my hat is or whatever like that. So really take care with the before and after part of the dive and the dive will take care of itself. That's my biggest tip for you. Hope that helps. Good luck with the course, mate. All the best, Luke, to you. Um, team Pegleg, again, it's like the celebrity edition of Q&A. How you doing, Team Pegleg? Hashtag ass divers ready. Tea, milk or no? Depends, Pegleg. Depends what tea. I'm drinking English breakfast tea, standard NATO issue, strong, sweet, slightly milky. Uh, I'll put a little overhead shot of the color. Uh, just a dash of milk, just, to, just enough to make it opaque. I also drink Darjeeling from time to time because I'm classy AF with a slice of lemon. 
Thanks for your question. Great question. Love my tea. Uh, also chocolate biscuit on the side. <laughs> FB Medic. Hashtag Ask Divers Ready. As I contemplate technical diving, I keep hearing research where you want to train or research technical instructors. Cool. But as I start researching, I can find thousands of dive centers or instructors who claim to teach technical diving. But as far as I know, that instructor could have just done a class and then never did a technical dive again, or could just be a bad, unsafe technical diver. So what are some of the ways to determine a good technical instructor dive center versus someone who just wants their title or to be able to charge more? Uh, it's a fantastic question and really the best way is to talk to them, I mean to probe them. And it can be hard coming from the outside and not knowing what questions to ask. I do have a blog on my Miami technical diving website about questions to ask your technical diving instructor before you hand over your hard earned cash. One day I'm gonna take that blog and turn it into a video. Haven't done that yet. So for now, let me just say, really question them about their experience. Question them about, even if the answers won't even make sense to you right now, ask them how many technical dives they've done. How many do they do a year? How many of these tech courses do they teach per year? And then push them, okay, where do your students come from? And the more detail you can extract, it's kind of like an interrogation like the police do, that you're trying to really narrow down exactly their experience. So I teach, I'll tell you right now, I teach about 50% technical diving and 50% recreational diving. And I'm busy 52 weeks of the year, usually, okay? Now, I'm teaching tech, tech, tech. Sometimes it happens I do four tech courses in a row and then there's two months off. That for me isn't so much of a problem. What you want to avoid is the person that teaches one tech course a year. Then you're gonna get rusty. The other thing to ask is where are they based? Where are they teaching? What facilities do they have? What dive sites do they have? Have them describe the dive sites to you. If they can't do that with enough detail, then they probably aren't that familiar with it and that should be a red flag right there. Look for a dive instructor who teaches in a technical diving hotspot. South Florida, you throw a rock into a bar, you're gonna hit three tech instructors and they're probably all gonna be really, really active because we've got a ton of great technical diving down here. So just, just have a look at that and have a look at it from a geographical point of view and from an interrogational point of view of really getting into the detail and the weeds of their experience. I hope that helps. I hope that answers your question. I think that'll about do it for this month. So let me just wrap up and say a great big thank you again to everyone who's been supporting me as I get this blasted ear fixed. It really means the world to me. Uh, and yeah, I'm just gonna keep pumping out the content now. That's it, hammer down, let's go till I can get back in the water. So until next time, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already. Until next time, my name's James. This was your Divers Ready channel update and Q&A from me and Bonham for the month of February 2021. Dive safe, dive often.